Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast of the Talberg Foundation. Can progress in the neurosciences lead to a second renaissance? What are the frontiers currently being explored in this field? And does this have the potential to put the core values of what it means to be human at risk? In this episode, Alan Stoga, the chairman of the Talberg Foundation, discusses these and other questions with Raphael Houston, Professor of Biological Sciences at Columbia University and 2018 Laureate of the Talberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. So Rafa, you are a leading neuroscientist. You're at the cutting edge of innovation in your field. You are both an active part of what's going on in neuroscience, but also deeply embedded in what everybody else is doing in neuroscience. And I've heard you several times, really quite elegantly, talk about the potential for a new renaissance, that if, as you, your colleagues, others better understand the mind in in the next years and decades, the potential for a real explosion of human knowledge uh, is, is there. Do you really believe that? No, oh, absolutely. You're making me blush, by the way. But um, I really believe it. If you look at uh, the history of, uh, of humanity, uh, we've been struggling uh, all along trying to uh, find out who we are. No? And that uh, has led to uh, all kinds of uh, activities and disciplines. It's just like... Uh, Waves hitting the the shore, generation after generation. There, there's been theories and there's been attempts to understand the human condition. No? And um, at the same time, if you just look at it coldly, as a scientist, like, hey, we're just uh, animals. We're metasoans. We are belong to the primate lineage, and we are very special because we have a huge brain. And uh, in fact, we know the brain generates um, mental activity and humans are the mental animals by uh, per excellence. So if we were to understand the brain, we would understand ourselves. That's it. Because everything we are, it's not an accident or it's not black magic. It's just generated by these neural circuits, these uh, 84 billion neurons that we have in our inside our skull. So to me, this is the ultimate uh, humanism to understand who we are goes through understanding the tissue that generates our our mental world our mind and uh, and i think it's going to be a, a renaissance in fact i think i think it's going to be more than the, the the renaissance was because the renaissance also tried to understand the role of uh, humans in in the world um and it was uh, a phenomenal uh, event that has propelled us till today and led to the development of science and an explosion in, in the arts. But it really didn't reach the uh, the bottom, no, which is... Uh, so it, it's good that to not just understand the role of humans in the world, but understanding actually what humans really are. No? I don't want to put you or anybody in a box of being either an optimist or a pessimist because those boxes are ridiculous. Nonetheless, self-knowledge, which is what you've just described, that the human humans could actually understand who they are, could actually understand their potential. Uh, the implication of the Renaissance in both our minds is really quite positive, that we would take that, we, humanity, would take that understanding and take it to a new place, take the human condition to a new place. Uh, those are two different things. So why are you, I apologize for the word, optimistic, yeah. that the better angels uh, would predominate in, in leveraging that knowledge, that information, that, that self-awareness that, that you see coming in, in a positive direction. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, knowledge is always um, uh, good. It dispels uh, prejudices. It, understanding, in my, my book, is, is the, the recipe for, for progress and for, um, or for well-being of the society. And if you just take take us as humans and we have our our positive and negative aspects in our personality. But again, those things are not just coming out of thin air. They're generated by our brain. So imagine if we understood that. No? So then we would be able to uh, to manage ourselves with a way um, that is actually much more appropriate than the way that we're uh, handling ourselves today. So 
just let me just give you one example. So uh, the existence of wars. No? So it's a uh, it, it's a, a terrible uh, um, page that we've written in our history. And even in 2020, people are killing themselves by uh, by the millions. No? And for reasons that are completely idiotic. I mean, if you think about it, it's it's just not uh, there's not much. Uh, a defense of why people should kill themselves and and subject themselves to this terrible pain, and imagine that we understood how human conflict is generated by the brain. No? So we could um, design strategies to inactivate these uh, problems before they they arise. No, before they generate uh, pain, suffering, and 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 wars. No, so. Uh, why not? Let me push on that because that is a good example. Can you imagine clearly understanding why is one thing, intervening to prevent is another thing. If you had complete knowledge of how the brain works, you could presumably discourage conflict, encourage collaboration, uh, discourage enmity, encourage more positive interactions. Uh, it, and it would be one thing if one is doing that, because I'm about to go to free will, if one is doing that, presenting people with, with rational s explanations of their behavior and letting them choose, um, mankind's history would suggest there's still going to be some people that choose uh, the wrong way rather than the better way. Uh, clearly, and this points towards some of your issues around the interaction, intersection perhaps, of artificial intelligence and neurotechnology down the road, but, and we want to talk about those. Um, but, but how do you respond to, how do you think about rather that dilemma, the dilemma between giving people the knowledge to make a rational decision and intervening either invasively or non-invasively in someone's mind to get them to do the right thing, however that right thing is defined. Yeah. So I, I think at the end of the day, intelligence leads to solutions um, which uh, should be synergistic and positive for the group. Um, so we're at Columbia here. Our motto in the university, illuminate tuo, be the vimos lumen. In your light, we see the light. And I am completely convinced that a lot of the um, misuses of knowledge and technology that you're alluding to uh, are at the end of the day explained by lack of intelligence that it, an intelligent behavior um, and it goes back to to uh, centuries Kant was arguing the end of war no I mean if you have a system that is anchored on intelligence and on, on rationality no you should uh, uh, by itself, it, it should prevent uh, the misuse of, of knowledge and technology. No? But technology is almost by definition amoral. Uh, nitrogen is nitrogen. Yeah. Discovery of nitrogen produces the possibility of fertilizer, the green revolution, but it also produces explosives, changes the nature of warfare, makes it much more violent, much more deadly, and gives comparative advantages to those who control the technology. <laughs> Uh, so the technology itself arguably is amoral, uh, but technologists aren't necessarily amoral. They can be moral or immoral. I'm not talking about individual countries, but the uh, uh, empowered uh, UN or an empowered international uh, government, uh, that could um, uh, channel the growth of science and uh, the development of products so that we avoid these um, more negative aspects of our technology. You know? So um, I don't know why uh, we cannot do that. No, I think we scientists themselves uh, operate in groups and we are uh, um, through through collaboration that stretches through the, the world and through history. Um, we've put, a, I would say, a good, uh, a good show. Uh, and I think it's actually uh, time for maybe uh, science and society to be better integrated, you know, so that the scientists are, are more informed of the goals of the society and vice versa. And society also takes science um, um, maybe as the forefront of the, of, the, uh, of, of the ship, as the flagship. You know? I want to come back to that. Specifically, we're in your lab. What is, if you could summarize in just a few words, what are you trying to do here? Yeah. So we're trying to understand um, how the mind works. We, like many people before us, now our take on it 
is that uh, we're going after the cerebral cortex, which is the largest part of our brain in, in, uh, in mammals, not just in humans. And we know now for more than 100 years that is the place that generates uh, higher cognition, um, perception, memory, imagination, uh, speech, um, essentially everything that makes us human is anchored in the cerebral cortex. Well, the cerebral cortex is a, apparently a very simple machine. It's built the same way across all humans, across all mammals. So that essentially the, the brain or the cerebral cortex of a mouse and the cerebral cortex of a human is the same, just scale different. Exactly, exactly. And then uh, that opens the possibility to, uh, in order to understand this huge question, what is the mind? Okay, we can put it scientifically in a very focused uh, problem to be solved, which is how does a little piece of the cortex of a mouse works? Because if we can figure this out, we can come up with general principles that can be applied to understand the rest of the cortex, not just in mice, but all the way in human to humans. Huh? And what we're working on is a hypothesis that the function of the cortex is to generate internal states of activity. Uh, which would be uh, essentially a group of neurons that would fire together independently of the world. And that is operationally a thought. Exactly. So that could be many things. Uh, first of all, we've seen this happen. We've seen that there are groups of neurons in the cortex, in the visual cortex, to be more precise, of a mouse that are activated uh, endogenously, spontaneously. And they also reflect uh, the visual stimulus when we show the mouse a particular stimulus. That group of neurons turns on. We call these groups ensembles. Other people have called them attractors. There are many different names in, in history. But the reason this is important is because uh, this could be the way, this could be the essence of what the brain does, of what the cortex does. It essentially generates internal states that are then used as symbols of the outside world. And then you can, instead of manipulating the world, you manipulate these internal states mentally. So uh, you can use these internal states uh, as symbols for thoughts, as symbols for things, as, as memories, as motor planning. It's essentially uh, can be used as a building block to build a mental world. So you use the word manipulate and you use it in a technical sense. It's not a loaded word. No, no, no. You're persuaded and I understand in your laboratory, you are able to manipulate those states. Exactly. In ways that cause, that, that, that replicate what nature itself would do. Well, yeah. W what do I say uh, what I say? Well, because we can see these groups of neuro ensembles firing in the brain of a mouse. When the mouse is uh, responding to a visual stimulus and then if we stop the visual stimulus and activate these neurons f from the outside with lasers, the mouse behaves. From the outside. Exactly. The mouse behaves as if he had seen this stimulus. In other words, we can su supplant the visual stimulus, the perception, by activating these groups of neurons. That's astounding on the face of it to a non-scientist. Uh, but where do you take that? What does that imply about man, humankind? What does it imply about the potential to, and again, I use the word in the way you did, air quotes on, manipulate the mind of an individual through external stimulation? Yeah. Um, well, this, uh, these results line up very well with the philosophy of Kant, who argued that um, the mind is not as, as, uh, as Peris and Peris uh, had argued before, that the mind reflects the world. And what Kant said, no, 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 it's the other way around. The world reflects the mind. The world is constructed by our mind. And if we can interfere, as we've already shown in this construction, we can, we can generate an, an artificial perception in a mouse and we can make the mouse behave like a puppet, whether we put this perception or not into his brain using lasers by activating these cortical neurons. So that obviously uh, uh, means that uh, something like that can be done in humans. Um, the more we know about how the mind is built with these groups of neurons, the more we're going to be able to decipher the mind and also alter the mind you know, by 
reading out the activity of these neurons and also changing the activity of these neurons with some of the methods that we're using in our lab for the mice. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, I think it, it's uh, this is the first time that um, humanity is going to have access to the contents of our brains. And uh, again, and that's, I think it's a phenomenal turning point in our history because we're going to finally see who we are. But it, this has to be done um, responsibly. Uh, and just alluding to this issue of society, but societal values driving uh, the scientific enterprise, I think we have the duty of making sure that these methods and this knowledge is uh, is channeled uh, to the common uh, good. No? Well, and let's talk about that now, because you clearly are spending an enormous amount of time both thinking about, but now trying to develop uh, responsible responses to the knowledge you see coming out of your labs and elsewhere. Uh, because we don't have global government. Yeah. Uh, we have, in fact, a global system that incre is looking pretty creaky at the moment, uh, certainly incapable of understanding or not capable of understanding the work you're doing, never mind respond positively to it. Um, so you are obviously deeply concerned about that and are, are working to create an awareness of what ha of your work and others' work, and also a positive societal and perhaps governmental response. Uh, what what is the core of that work? What what is the core problem you're concerned with? How do you boil down this, yeah. this concept of neural identity? Well, um, so I mean, we can uh, sit here and wait for uh, the world to get there its act together, uh, or we can try to do something about it in a small way. And I think it's our duty to try to uh, to help. In our case, to do the right thing means that we've assembled a small team of people that we call it the Neural Rights Initiative. And we're promoting, uh, we're advocates, uh, like a, a, a scientific advocacy startup, so to speak. Uh, we're promoting the development of ethical and societal guidelines for novel neurotechnologies and uh, to try to get the society prepared as much as possible for this revolution. And when you say society, you're not just talking about the United States, you're not just talking about the West, you're talking about society at the global level. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, we, we are in fact uh, working globally. Uh, we're working uh, quite intensely with, uh, with the Republic of Chile uh, with Spain, and we're trying to also um, uh, get the European uh, Community uh, Commission interested in this, and we have contacts in in, in different countries that we're pursuing. Um, that would be our success if uh, world leaders assume this agenda as their own uh, and they run with it, because that that's that's partly our our job to serve as bridges between the the world of science and the world of of policy making and, and change. And then the other goal is uh, to the society in general, to the citizenship, to educate the society about the uh, the, the perils and also the, the, and the good things about this new technology and how it should be channeled. So, so you could think, well, is it just uh, crazy? Why would you want to do that? Uh, the world doesn't work like this. Well, so respectfully, I, I would disagree with people that, that um, that voice these criticisms because um, as, as in, in our history, uh, we have uh, an excellent example of a technology that uh, has been developed, uh, it's very powerful, can be used very effectively to kill people or to damage uh, uh, people physically or mentally, and that technology is called medicine. So medicine, at the end of the day, is just another technology. It's neutral. It can be used for good and for bad. And the, the knowledge associated with, with uh, how the body works um, has been channeled for 2,000 years in a profession whose purpose, uh, it's a humanistic purpose. It's an ethical uh, profession. The doctors throughout the history swear the Hippocratic Oath to apply their knowledge for the beneficence of the patients. And, and they have the rule by the principle of beneficence, the principle of justice, and the principle of human dignity. So. So if medicine has done it, why cannot we do it with new technology? And, uh, and in that case, just like uh, the impact of medicine in the world has been overwhelmingly positive, well, why couldn't the impact of new technology in the world be overwhelmingly positive as well? So one path is 
to work with the technologists and scientists to develop among them this the, the moral equivalent of a, of a Hippocratic oath. Exactly. The other path is to work with the with governments and with, I suppose, the United Nations and other global organizations to try to create awareness on the one hand and hopefully protection on the other hand. And the protection, but I want you to define this, you talk about neuroidentity yeah. because the question is, what are we protecting here? Yeah, well, okay. what, what, is, what is the missing yeah. piece in the, in the ensemble, to use your word? So we're talking about the core uh, values that define what it means to be a human. Uh, which is uh, the self, the, our identity, our free will, our ability to make decisions, um, and our, the contents of our mind. And, and those aren't protected in law anywhere as far as you know? <laughs> They're not protected any, anywhere in the world. They've never been protected because no one ever dreamt that they could be up for grabs. No? Um, so in the uh, 1948, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they are absent from this declaration because who would have thought that the self is something that can be uh, damaged and can be manipulated or altered or the, uh, or the privacy of our thoughts? Who would have thought that someone could ever read the contents of your mind or that it could change your, your decision making, interfere with your free will? But that today is a real possibility. We're not quite there yet, but we are clearly in your mind, to be precise, on that path We're, that this is an issue we need to yeah, address. Not only are we on that path, we can do this already with, in animals. We can do this every day. In, in our lab in mice. And uh, there are more and more um, technologies that are being developed that are non-invasive. So I'm not talking about neurosurgery, I'm talking about wearable devices that you can you can attach to your head with a cap or a, or a diadem and that uh, enable you uh, still in a primitive fashion, but increasingly with more power to uh, start to decode uh, some basic uh, mental processes. And if you can decode, you can manipulate, or someone could manipulate. Yeah, it, it's going to come later. So just just uh, taking the page from the development of neuroscience uh, to read the activity of the brain and decode it is easier than to go in and interfere with it, uh, knowing what you're doing. Right. But it will come. Uh, I'm it's guaranteed that it will come. We already are doing that in 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 uh, animal work. It will. All of this will get translated to to humans, and for a good reason. We need to do this in in patients. Huh? Um, so you asked me earlier, what are we working on? And I said, well, trying to understand this little brick of the of mental processing, which is what is a thought. Well, it turns out that in mice that have uh, a mutation which is similar to some human schizophrenics, these uh, ensembles of neurons are abnormal. If we look at the activity of the brain in these mice, we can tell whether the mouse is normal or schizophrenic, in quotation marks. So, uh, so this, of course, is extremely important uh, for uh, for the clinic because if this is the main problem that underlies schizophrenia, we are duty bound to go in there with our methods and interfere with the uh, neural circuits in the cortex of these patients to try to. Uh, prevent this uh, this disease now. So that's a perfect example of the positive application exactly. of this and the urgency of pursuing the, the technology. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at the same time, this tells you that we're going to be doing this to to people, and, um, and that's and because of that, uh, and because also of uh, of the pace of the the development of this neurotechnology. Uh, we need to have some basic protection so that these methods are used responsibly. And in our minds, this is a human rights issue. Uh, it's not about putting a little law here and add it to the uh, ex existing legislation so that things, bad things don't happen. No, no, we're dealing for the first time in our history with the essence of what constitutes a human, what constitutes a, a person, no, the identity, the free will, the mental privacy. And this is also... Um, particularly uh, important that we do this now because uh, of the possibility of using technology, this same neurotechnology that we're developing to help patients and understand who we are, is going to be used to uh, mentally augment people, to cognitively augment them so that they have increased uh, abilities, uh, uh, mental abilities, cognitive abilities, 
And in fact, there are companies um, like Elon Musk and Neuralink whose whole purpose is to mentally augment people. So I'm not making this up. There are people who are building devices to do this now. This isn't science fiction, this is science. And your argument is, and your reality is that we really need to be moving now on this, which is why the neuro identity and neuro rights initiatives that you're pushing are so important. Yeah, um, um, I think we should go to the heart of the matter, which is what it means, what does it mean to be a human? Um, and, um, and, and stop and think about it and uh, redefine uh, humans and use the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to do that. So I think we, we, we should act, and I think we should act quickly because the threats, I'm particularly worried in, about the threat to our mental privacy. I think this is something that's going to be up for grabs very soon, uh, uh -huh. given what I know about what uh, companies are developing and how this technology is progressing. So this is, in my mind, this should, this should be the first uh, most urgent uh, thing that we should protect uh, from the point of view of human rights. Well, and indeed, that's part of the reason why the Telberg Foundation uh, selected you as one of the Telberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize winners uh, in the past and why we remain engaged with you from the Telberg's point of view, because I can't imagine any initiative that's more important, uh, more urgent, uh, more need to be global, because uh, if it's not global, it fails by definition. So thank you for your advocacy. Well, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm speaking also on behalf of uh, many people like myself. Uh, you may have recognized one particular person, but uh, we're part of a team. Thank you for your work. We need to do this together. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please check our website, www.talbergfoundation.org, for more podcasts, videos, and articles, and follow us on social media to stay tuned to upcoming events.